actually in some ways simpler than, than Mesa. <laughs>get started. Uh, so it, uh, it, it really gives me great pleasure today to introduce uh, someone who I think is, is uh, really one of the great uh, thinkers uh, and um, most impactful and thoughtful contributors to the theory of planets. Uh, and uh, the last 20 years have been an incredibly exciting time. In, in the study of planets both inside and outside the solar system. And a lot of what we have learned from data uh, has been shaped by today's speaker, Jonathan Portney. Uh, he's made really uh, seminal contributions to the thermal evolution of giant planets both inside and outside the solar system. Um, remarkably insightful papers into the structure and the chemistry and the resulting spectra of uh, the atmospheres of exoplanets. Uh, of all compositions, and uh, also has made very important contributions to the thermal emission spectra of brown dwarfs uh, and the formation of clouds in their atmospheres, and also applied that theory to very massive uh, gas giants that we might see around other stars. Um, so Jonathan uh, graduated from Iowa State and then completed his PhD in planetary sciences at the University of Arizona before <laughs> moving to Ames, where he was an NRC fellow and then a Spitzer fellow and uh, has won a number of awards, including the URI Prize from the Division of Planetary Sciences uh, and the Sloan Research Fellowship and many others. And then the trouble with being prominent in your field and uh, becoming more senior, we were talking last night about how we don't feel we're very old in age, but we're awfully old in exoplanets, is that um, you've taken on a number of uh, responsibilities. And I, I was looking at your CV, and I think the one that you probably enjoy the most is being the director of the Other Worlds Laboratory at UC Santa Cruz. That looks like a lot of fun. Um, the one that probably I predict is going to take the most time over the coming year is that I, uh, I understand you also serve on the steering committee for the 2020 Decadal Survey. And uh, so we wish you all the best in that endeavor. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and so with that, uh, Jonathan, we're going to bring you up, and we'd love to hear um, right. your cloakroom today. Well, thanks. Thanks for the very nice introduction, Dave. Um, I really like coming to the CFA. I've been here quite a number of times over the past, I don't know, 15 plus years, um, and it's great to be giving the, uh, the cloakroom today. So <clears throat> my, my little talk at lunch today was about Jupiter and Saturn specifically, and that's typically how people have thought about planetary physics single objects or comparative between two objects. Um, if there's a takeaway about today, it's really uh, that the exoplanet revolution has really, you can think of that in terms of the statistics of exoplanets. But you can also think about, can you use statistics and can you use a sample size to learn something not just about planetary um, abundance, but can you learn something about the physics of the planets from having a large sample size? And of course the answer is yes, but this is really a new realm of planetary physics where you've gone from a sample size of a few to a sample size of many, so we're really just starting. Of course, we don't have spectra of millions of galaxies, but when you start to go from a sample size of a handful to dozens or eventually hundreds, you really can pull out new interesting things to say that you couldn't say with a smaller sample size. And that's kind of the general theme of the talk today. So, uh, today's talk is focused on giant planets generally, so the things we'd like to know are what's the formation, evolution, interior physics, atmospheric physics, 
And these can, I tend to think of this as being brought up into two categories. We want to understand how planets work, what's the physics and chemistry going on within the planets, and understand how planets form, how to connect what we see today to better understand the formation of those planets. And so when you think about giant planets, you may in your mind think about a Jupiter or a hot Jupiter, but there's really a huge amount of diversity, right? So we know objects that are five Earth masses that have a, a, a fair amount of hydrogen and helium that makes up a lot, a lot of their volume. And you might call that a mini Neptune, but it, its volume might well be dominated by hydrogen and helium. You, you de we definitely have things that are like 5,000 Earth masses, which is about like 10 or 15 Jupiter masses. And those things are also gas giant planets. So it's a really large phase space. So just for reference, Jupiter is about 300 Earth masses. So a unified view of all those objects might be a lot to ask, right? That's a really large realm of, of parameter space, a, a large diversity in mass. So we want to think about a hierarchy of questions that we can try to ask given the data that we have, both inside and outside the solar system. So for transiting planets, this has been rapidly changing over time. So a lot of people think about the mass radius relation. What does that tell you about a planet's composition? So you can compute mass radius relations. People have done that for a long time. There's, of course, a classic uh, Zapolsky and Saltpeter paper from the 60s. This is from Dave Stevenson, 1982. We have radius and Earth radii, mass and Earth masses. We have Uranus and Neptune, Jupiter and Saturn. We have hydrogen helium models up here. We have watery models down here, rock models down there. And so you can plot those four planets on that diagram. We can jump ahead to an article led by a gentleman named Charbonneau um, this is from Protostars and Planets 5, I think. And uh, at the time, I think there were nine transiting planets. And you can see this is in Jupiter masses, this is in Jupiter radii. So it's kind of a small corner of parameter space. So you can see Jupiter and Saturn on this diagram. You can see versions of Saturn that look a little bit denser, lower density versions. There's HD 209458b. But then we jump ahead. This is already a little out of date. These are the objects where we were relatively well known mass and radius. You can see there's Jupiter and Saturn over here. This is mass and Earth masses, mass and Jupiter masses. Earth radii, Jupiter radii, they differ by about a factor of 11. Jupiter and Saturn are here, Uranus and Neptune down there. So, so there's already more objects being found all the time. And so a question is, okay, there's a blizzard of objects here. There's a couple hundred gas giants with masses and radii. You can find uh, the, de the, the, the units of the density here are SI density units, so it doesn't really matter, but this, this dashed line here is a density of 0.1 grams per cubic centimeter, a bulk density kind of like styrofoam. The density over here is 100 times higher, 10 grams per cubic centimeter. So gas giants have a wide range in density because hydrogen is a very compressible material. As you add more and more, you don't change the radius very much. So the question is, in this blizzard of points with most of these objects being fluffier and less dense than Jupiter and Saturn, can you start to think about what the unifying characteristics of this class are? What's the physics that unifies these objects? That's part of what I want to talk about today. Oh, those are just color coded to guide your eye. So this is like, I think I, I, I chopped the mass at like 30 Earth masses here. So these are just things perhaps more like Saturn, things perhaps more like Neptune. So, um, we can kind of categorize planets based on our solar system preconceived notions. So today, today's talk is really focused on things that are on the left side of the diagram. So Neptune uh, is mostly metals, speaking like an astronomer. It's mostly fluid ionic, a sea of liquid uh, water, things you might call ices and rock, um, with a relatively thin skin of hydrogen and helium. That's maybe 15% of the planet's mass. The abundances we can see in the atmosphere suggest it's very metal enriched, 50 to 100 times solar, much more enriched in metals compared to the sun. For Jupiter itself, Jupiter is mostly hydrogen and helium, but its atmosphere is also enriched in metals compared to the sun, about three times solar. We think Jupiter is a fully convective object, so we think it's probably three times solar in the whole envelope. From Juno, we think the core of Jupiter is maybe about 10 or 15 Earth masses. The core, if you want to think of Neptune as a core, it's mostly core, but that's also around 15 Earth masses. And so, of course, we have rocky planets on the right. We're not going to be talking about those today, but we have a large sample size of objects that are potentially like Uranus and Neptune that we want to be able to understand better.
So I showed this talk earlier today, showed the slide earlier today, but the astronomical perspective allows you to ask and answer questions you just couldn't answer in the solar system because your sample size isn't large enough, your phase space isn't big enough. But we can complement that with detailed work in, with the, in the solar system to tell you if you're working from a solid foundation. So to, earlier today, I talked about Jupiter and Saturn. So we're really trying to do larger scale comparative planetary science. So this is a plot that shows uh, the modern theory of how we think gas giant planets formed by Pollock et al. 1996. This is the most cited paper in the history of the journal Icarus. Uh, it, it came out at an important time, 1996, around the, around, the, around the first detection of hot Jupiters. And uh, this is a group with Jim Pollock and Peter Bodenheimer that in the 80s and 90s did a lot of seminal work on gas giant planet formation. And so the- There was a very important embed between the received and revised. They submitted it just before 51K. Yeah. It was announced. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, anyway, um, uh, Jim Pollock passed away before the paper came out as well. So he was, he was at NASA Ames for his, for his whole career. He was a very seminal figure. Um, so the basic idea is that in solid, we're plotting the Z mass, the metal mass. In dash dot, we're, we're plotting the total mass. And in dotted, we're plotting the XY, the hydrogen helium mass. So there's a lot of variance on this theory, but the basic idea is that you build up a core of 10 or 20 Earth masses first, and that's in the nebula, and that 10 or 20 Earth masses then accretes hydrogen helium gas, and then you reach some sort of almost runaway where you're accreting a huge amount of hydrogen helium, and this stops at some point, and you form a gas giant planet. So you, for, you, have, you have a core that's metal, and then you're accreting more metals as the planet forms. So the natural expectation is that gas giants should always be metal enriched compared to their parent stars. Not just because they have a core, but they're also accreting a lot of metals as they're accreting gas. So we see this in the solar system. That's a really small sample size. We'd like to understand that better in exoplanetary systems. This also is, this also is the same basic idea of how we think these kind of mini Neptunes form that, that Kepler has found in abundance. There you're not reaching a critical core mass, but you're, maybe your core is only five or 10 Earth masses and you're accreting a thin skin of hydrogen helium on top of that. That's the first part I want to talk about today. So uh, when the Kepler-11 system got published, that was at a critical time for uh, one of my previous grad students, Eric Lopez, who's now at NASA Goddard. And so this has been surpassed by, I guess, other cool multi-planet systems like TRAPPIST-1, but this was the cover of Nature in 2011, Six New Worlds. There were six low-mass, low density planets transiting Kepler 11. They're all more massive than the Earth, but they're all much lower density. They all have to have some amount of hydrogen helium envelopes. This is this was a planetary system that we hadn't seen seen uh, up until that time. So one of the things that Eric did when he was a grad student working with me is we took models that we developed previously to model the evolution of Neptune and gas giants and we modified that model to work for mini Neptune. And so uh, it's, it's, a, it's an evolution mo co code that's somewhat like a Henye code you might have done for stellar evolution. It's not quite the same thing, but there's different energy sources we have to put in there. So we have the total luminosity of the planet. So we've got, this is the luminosity over time. The planet's contracting, it's cooling off. So there's a core luminosity. That's due to just the core is a, we treat it as a ball of rock. It has some heat capacity that core cools off over time. So this is for a five Earth mass planet with 1% of its mass in hydrogen and helium. We put in some radioactive decay due to long-lived radionuclides, and then the envelope itself is hydrogen and helium that cools off over time. So in this model, we're watching a planet contract as its interior cools off. And what we can do is we can make models like that over a bunch of different masses, and we can essentially plot the Kepler-11 system, planets B, C, or are there D, E, and F on this diagram, and so in our 2012 paper, we basically looked at the range of planets in that system, and we said, well, typically they have maybe a few percent up to maybe 15% of their mass in hydrogen and helium. So somewhat similar to Uranus and Neptune, lower mass planets, but again, maybe 10% of their mass in hydrogen and helium, give or take. Eric then went on to then look at um, the evolution of these objects. So at the time, we already knew that hot Jupiters lose mass 
So this has been this has been discovered almost 10 years previous to that by the Hubble Space Telescope. This, are, this is this is an artist's conception. This is a, a, a model, but the basic idea is that uh, X-ray and UV flux from the parent star is absorbed by the planet's atmosphere and drives a wind off the top of the planet's atmosphere. That gas is then lost. And so we can see this process happening today for hot Jupiters. And we think it's important, but it doesn't dramatically change the character of the object. So if a gas giant planet like a hot Jupiter loses one Earth mass per giga year, it doesn't really change the structure of your planet. However, if you're a mini Neptune planet, and you lose one Earth mass per giga year, that's dramatically going to change the entire structure of your planet. It might convert it from a mini Neptune into a rocky planet that doesn't have any hydrogen helium at all. And so one of the things uh, we did in 2012 and 2013 was Eric uh, made a plot thinking about uh, people had modeled this process. This is an equation that describes the mass loss rate. Uh, people had applied this to hot Jupiters. It depends on the mass of the planet, the flux coming from the parent star, and actually the, the density of the planet. So less dense planets are more likely to lose mass. And one of the things Eric did is he plotted all the known planets at that time versus this mass loss equation. He, he noticed, I think he was the first to notice this, that the upper left of this diagram is devoid of planets. So there's no low density planets at high incident fluxes. They don't exist in the upper left corner of face space. And he plotted the Kepler-11 planets and a few other objects over here. And Eric wondered, and I, we wondered if we could model this process too. And so we made a little grid of a bunch of different planet masses at a bunch of different hydrogen helium envelope mass fractions. And we evolved them over time, over from 10 million years to 100 million years and 10 giga years. And indeed, we could reproduce this behavior that if you started with a kind of a square grid, you would naturally lose the upper left-hand side. Those planets lose mass over time. You're, turning, you're taking mini Neptunes, they're losing their envelopes, they're being converted to hot rocks, to hot super-Earths. And so this naturally explained, we thought, what we were seeing in the Kepler-11 system. We then looked ahead to a larger sample size. And so in Eric's paper in 2013, we looked at a large grid of possible planets where we looked at incident flux going from high fluxes to low fluxes, planet radius starting with a grid where we fully populated the space, and we ran that forward in time for billions of years. And what we found was that as planets contracted, they also lost mass. And we naturally uh, ended up finding a valley in occurrence where planets that always started out rocky stayed rocky. Planets that started out very hot and fluffy lost mass, and they've shrunk down. And there was a valley between objects that were rocky and objects that have relatively thicker hydrogen helium envelopes. If you had a thin hydrogen helium envelope, you were likely either to lose it and become a rock, or if you had a little more mass, you'd keep it. And so there was a valley of occurrence. This was predicted by Eric and myself, and also James Owen and Yan Chin Wu in 2013. And a feature like this was indeed found by Fulton et al. in 2017 uh, and Van Allen et al. in 2017. These are plotted backwards compared to, so, to our original paper. But this is uh, the full Kepler sample. This is in uh, occurrence color-coded by planet size versus orbital period. And you can see there's a natural bifurcation into the mini Neptunes and the super Earths. This is a large sample size. This is a very small sample size, but all these systems have astro-seismic stellar parameters, so everything in these systems is known very precisely. So you can see there's a cl very clear uh, gap between the rocky planets of smaller sizes, below about 1.7 Earth radii, and the ob larger objects about 2.5 two and two and Earth radii. And so this has been known as the radius gap, or occurrence valley, or Fulton gap, and it's a really active area of study today with TESS. So the sub-Neptune population is sculpted by some kind of mass loss. Uh, some of the predictions are that it's evaporative mass loss. There's been other mass loss models people have suggested. It's a really important work in progress in the field today with tests. The location and slope suggests uh, uh, hydrogen helium envelopes atop rock cores. Uh, this suggests there probably is a paucity of water worlds, but that's still TBD. We don't really know that quite yet. And this suggests possible in situ formation of these planets. TESS is delivering planets on both sides of the gap for detailed study and planets inside the gap for detailed study. 
We'd like to follow those up with the James Webb Space Telescope to understand their atmospheric composition uh, much better. So this is an example where um, occurrence, rate, uh, occurrence rates have told us something about the physics of those objects. With a sample size of a couple or a one particular planetary <laughs> system, you might be able to tell part of the story. But with a large sample size, you can tell a more complete story. And so this was a paper that got me thinking about to what degree could we learn more about planets by thinking about them as a population, not as individual objects. So I want to come back and talk more about the gas giants. Um, we can come back to this basic idea of planet formation, that uh, we think the formation process should, last, should leave some sort of imprint on the planet's composition. And so for the gas giants, we think that that's metal enrichment to some degree. But we have a small sample size in the solar system to compare to these models. So this has been work that we've done in Santa Cruz with my uh, former grad student, Daniel Thorngren. Daniel just started a Trottier postdoc fellowship and, at the University of Montreal. So this project was whether or not we could understand planetary composition for this class of gas giant planets. So this is a plot of planet radius in Jupiter radii versus the incident flux. This is like the solar constant. So Higher fluxes over here, lower fluxes over here. It had been known for a while that the hottest of the hot Jupiters are the ones that are the most inflated. This problem's been with us for a long time now, this inflated radius problem of hot Jupiters. So I'll come back to that. The expectation for a typical one Jupiter mass planet that's several billion years old was kind of like this black curve here. The hot, hot Jupiters tend to be inflated. As you go to cooler and cooler planets, they tend to be not inflated. So one of the things that uh, we had noticed in my group was that once you go below about 2 times 10 to the 8th, which is ergs per second per centimeter squared, but what does that mean? That's about 1,000 degrees for your planets. Once you go cooler than about 1,000 degrees, planets kind of transition to most of the population being inflated to all the population either being consistent with this line or not inflated. It's just fine to be below the line. If you're below the line, that means you're overdense. That probably just means you have a lot of metals inside your planet. But we can do better than that. We can study this population of 46 planets in more detail to assess what the metallicity of the planets are in detail from evolution models. So the basic idea is a really simple argument. For none of these planets at the time did we have any atmospheric spectra. We just had their masses, radius, and the parent star's estimated age. So you can take an evolution model. The planets are contracting over time. This is radius versus time. A half Jupiter mass planet at, 1 AU, at 0.1 AU from the sun. If that planet's made of solar composition, it'll contract over time like this. If you imagine it has 30 Earth masses of metals inside of it, or 60 or 100, you're going to have a smaller radius at every age. So this is the simple-minded way to think about things. For any planet, we have its mass with an error bar, its radius with an error bar, and an estimated parent star age with an error bar. You could imagine running three evolution models. You could also imagine running, let's say, 3,000 evolution models and using the full error bar distribution on mass, radius, and age to assess the amount of metals that are given in any particular planet. And that's what we're doing. We're assessing the bulk metallicity from a structure, from an evolution model, not yet from their atmospheres. So we can do this for that sample size of 46 planets I mentioned, and we get diagrams that look like this. So for WASP-8, pretty generic, cooler, hot Jupiter, we assess something like uh, the amount of metals inside of it, something like a distribution from maybe 40 to 140 Earth masses. This is a particularly massive planet. For HAT-6, it's not that well determined, something like 0 to 20. One of the things we don't know for these planets is if the metals are mostly in a core or mostly in the envelope. For Jupiter, we think most of Jupiter's metals are probably in the envelope, not in the core, whereas for Saturn, we actually think most of Saturn's metals are in the core, not in the envelope. So for an exoplanet, we actually don't know which is which. So we can actually do both. So we can do all the metals in the core, all in the envelope. We can split the difference. That's part of the uncertainty that I'm going to quote here. So we can make a diagram that looks like this. This is the inferred heavy element mass, the inferred amount of mass in Earth masses of, of metals inside the planet from the structure model compared to planet mass for the 46 planets in our cool population. 
And so uh, what we see is that there's a definite trend with some definite scatter. So there's pretty good evidence for planets having at least 10 Earth masses of heavy elements inside them, which corresponds well with the core accretion model of gas giant planet formation. But then as you go to higher and higher masses, you're accreting more and more metals. So immediately we can say that we should not think of giant planets as being a 10 Earth mass core with just a bunch of hydrogen and helium piled on top. They're accreting a lot of metals as they're accreting the gas. So this is actual Saturn, actual Jupiter from solar system models. So we can see that there's no one way to make a Saturn, right? We can have Saturn mass planets that are more metal enriched. We can have Saturn mass planets that are more metal poor. And as we go to higher and higher planet masses, we have a lot of metal accretion. We have objects here that are oh, maybe a thousand Earth masses that have accreted something like 200 Earth masses of metals as they're accreting their hydrogen and helium. These gas giant planets are accreting a lot of solids in their nebula. We can look at this a different way by looking at the metal enrichment. So we can calculate Z planet, that comes from our structure model, the metallicity of the planet. We can compare that to Z star. All these stars have an iron abundance measurement from a high res spectrum. So we can compute what you might call Z star from the, from, the, from the iron abundance. And the ratio is what you might call the metallicity enhancement. So we can see that Saturn sits here, Jupiter sits here amongst its cousin planets. And so for the first time, we have a mass metallicity relation for giant planets that one can compare formation models to. And so this is going from about 20 Earth masses to about 10 Jupiter masses. So there's a characteristic slope for this population and a characteristic spread. To me, the spread is actually just as important and interesting as the slope in that it shows us there's a lot of, uh, of, of spread in how one makes giant planets. There's no one way to make a Saturn or a Jupiter. There's a lot of diversity and metallicity at any particular planet mass and that Jupiter and Saturn fit in well amongst their cousin planets. This is entirely complementary to what people are trying to do for atmospheres, but atmosphere study is potentially more rewarding, but it's a lot more difficult. So this is the same panel on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side is people trying to make a mass metallicity diagram from atmospheric abundances. In the solar system, we have in orange, Uranus and Neptune are about 100 times solar, in carbon in the form of methane, Saturn's about 10, Jupiter's about three. So in the solar system is a very nice trend with four planets. In exoplanets, oh, they're all too hot, we can't see methane, but we can see things like water vapor, sodium, potassium, and they each make their own relation or lack of relation. Um, so one of the things we'd like to know from the James Webb Space Telescope is, are there trends in atmospheric abundances? I think we should see them because the bulk metallicity is telling us that there's a trend. So to some degree, I think that should be reproduced in the atmosphere, but probably with more scatter. Ideally, we'd like to pick planets where we know the bulk metallicity from a structure model and then also try to understand their atmospheres because then we have the most information we could have. So these two ways of thinking are entirely complementary to each other. So this is, a, this is a typical plot you might see of planet mass versus orbital separation, right? People have been showing diagrams like this for a couple decades now. And this is typically how people think about um, characterizing planets. Where do they sit on the mass versus orbital separation diagram? But one of the things we can start to think about is this third dimension, and that is the compositional dimension. And so that can come from a bulk composition from a planet's density. That can come from atmospheric abundances, from measuring abundances in the planet's atmosphere. That can also come from measuring stellar abundances in the star and comparing them to what you see in the planet. And so this is a project that we started with uh, Johanna Teske to try to do some of this sort of science. So <clears throat> Johanna Teske is a, a, Carnegie, a Hubble fellow at Carnegie in Los Angeles. And so the basic idea was let's take the sample size of these 46 cold planets where we have a good assessment of the planet's bulk metallicity. Can we look for any correlations in what the stellar abundances are? 
So we looked not just for iron, we looked at uh, what we called the planet forming elements, oxygen, carbon, iron, silicon, magnesium, nickel. And so we couldn't do all 46 parent stars. A lot of them are too faint. We took the 20 brightest. We got Keck time uh, through myself and Magellan Mike time through Johanna over the course of many semesters. Uh, as, I, as I PI these proposals, I learned about weather and clouds and it comes and rains on your observatory. So what we thought we would bang out in three semesters took like seven, but uh, we eventually got the spectra for the systems that we needed. And so we made a diagram, again, this is metal enrichment Z planet over Z star, just looking at individual elements, oxygen, carbon, iron, and they all look basically kind of similar to each other. So this is from 2014 to 2017. We then made an aggregate, so we, Z planet again, Z planet comes from the structure model, Z star comes from the true Z star, it's not just from the iron abundance, it's from the abundance of all these planet forming elements, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, not nitrogen, sorry, nickel. And again, this relation we find is very similar to what we saw, there's a slope uh, with about minus one half with a spread around it. And so this, this planet mass metallicity relation looks basically like we found with the larger sample size with iron. So the question was, what more can we do with, with this data? So one of the things we wanted to ask was, do metal-rich stars make metal-rich planets? And that's a natural thing to ask because we know that metal-rich stars more commonly make gas giant planets, right? The higher the metallicity of your star, the more likely it is you'll find a gas giant planet. What we'd like to know is whether or not those planets themselves are following their star. And much to our surprise, we saw no evidence for that at all. So this is Z star. This is the star's metallicity from the spectrum of the star. And this is the residual metallicity. So the residual metallicity is, is whether or not you're on the low side of this diagram, you're, you're a metal poor sort of planet. And the residual metallicity on the high side is if you're a, a, more, a more metal rich sort of planet. And if planets definitely followed their stars, if the metal-rich planets were around the metal-rich stars, you'd expect a slope of one on this diagram. What we find was just kind of this weird blob uh, mess. You know, there's a slope to it, maybe, but there's definitely not a slope of one. And so I don't really know what to make of this. We spent a lot of time thinking about it, but apparently um, Nature doesn't seem to care that the metal-rich stars don't preferentially make more metal-rich planets. There's some sort of stochastic processes happening in the disk uh, that's, that is changing planet formation to some degree, that you can make a metal-rich star uh, planet. Uh, it doesn't have to be around a metal-rich star. So that's the question mark there. One of the things we did look for is could we find a trend, and one trend that we found that's yeah, it's not three sigma, so it's suggestive, was um, we saw a hint that stars with a higher volatile to refractory ratio. So we said the carbon and oxygen are the volatiles. These guys are the refractories. We did find that this residual metal tended to scale with this ratio, that uh, the stars that had a higher volatile to refractory ratio had a, weaker had a weak correlation that suggested that's where the metal-rich planets are. That might say something about planet formation at or around snow lines. I don't really know yet. Um, but this is something that we're gonna be following up in the next few years as we try to take our sample size from 20, ideally to 50 or 100 systems. So this is work in progress, but it's suggestive that planet formation might be a bit more complicated than we'd thought. So I wanna talk about a few more extensions of this sample of the population where uh, we looked again at this, this is a, an update of that diagram I showed before. So again, this is, uh, we have the hottest of the hot Jupiters, around 1500 Kelvin, these are the large radius objects, and as we go to cooler and cooler planets, they are not inflated anymore. As you might be aware, there's been a long-standing question for, uh, the question is why are these planets anomalously inflated? This question is 20 years old now, basically. And there's been a lot of explanations for why this is. The question that Daniel and I posed was whether or not the population itself could tell us something about the mechanism rather than trying to postulate yet another new mechanism and comparing it, what could the data tell us about the population? 
So this is uh, just a, uh, you're not supposed to take this in. This is just, uh, just the titles of a bunch of different papers people have written to try to assess why hot Jupiters are inflated in radius. So our question was whether or not we could look at the population to assess which one of these is right, if any. So the basic idea of the leading contenders are this generic idea that if you have a pressure temperature profile, this is the temperature in Kelvin, this is log of the pressure, so you're going down deeper into the atmosphere. This is not how people plot stellar profiles, this is kind of rotated. If you go down deeper into the atmosphere, you get hotter and hotter, and this is the deep interior adiabat. A cold, small planet would have a cold adiabat, a hot, fluffy planet would have a hot interior adiabat. So what people have noticed is that if you, if you, if you imagine some process that takes about 1% of the absorbed energy, let's say it's absorbed here, and you imagine some sort of dynamical mechanism that could shove 1% of that energy down into the deeper atmosphere, that would deposit enough energy to inflate the radius of your planet. There's been several different mechanisms where people have suggested dynamical mechanisms to transport a small fraction of the absorbed energy down deeper into the interior. So that's kind of a rule of thumb people have used, this kind of 1% number. <clears throat> so what we wanted to do is look at the population to assess what the population was telling us. So uh, if you run an evolution model and you stick some additional power into the deep interior, that stalls the contraction. So let's look at the dashed curves here. These are models where what we're doing is, we're, is the dashed black is a normal evolution model and the dashed magenta and dashed, dashed yellow are stopping the evolution by pumping in some 1% energy or 2% energy into the deep interior. You could also do that exact same calculation, but also put in, let's say, 30 Earth masses of metals into the deep interior, and that gives you these solid curves. So for a given planet, if you don't know the metallicity, you also can't assess the power, because those two things are, de are degenerate. Extra metallicity makes your planet's radius go smaller. Extra power makes your planet's radius become larger. If you don't know one, you can't know the other. So what we did is we, is we uh, have then from the sample, we have our mass metallicity relation. A uh, slide dropped out of here. So we have our known mass metallicity relation. So we use that as a prior to understand the composition for any individual planet. And so what we can do is then we can assess for any planet, we know its mass with an error bar, 0.69. We can assess its metallicity with an error bar from our mass metallicity relation. We then can assess this, uh, this power that we need, this maybe 1% number to explain the radius inflation. We can do that for the full sample of 200 planets. And we get a very curious diagram that looks like this. So this is the planet's equilibrium temperature, and this is this 1% number, this fraction of the parent star's energy that has to be deposited into the deep interior to explain the radius. So what we find that the population is telling us is that this looks almost exactly like a Gaussian. The relatively cool planets down here below 1,000 degrees, the population tells us there's nothing inflating the radius, so it falls off to relatively small numbers. As we go to hotter and hotter planets, they become more and more inflated. And this inflation power peaks at around 1,600 degrees. It actually then goes down like this. And the reason why it goes down is if you look at this diagram here, the planets aren't necessarily getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The planets that are around 1,600 degrees actually do appear the largest. And then as you go to hotter temperatures, there's not as many objects but these planets are not as inflated. And so this, this, uh, this, we, did, we, we fit with a Gaussian process, not making any assumption for what this form had to be, and it naturally came out that it was something like a Gaussian. As you get to the very hottest planets, the sufficiency actually goes down. And so we, we, we made this plot, and I stared at it, and I thought, gosh, I've seen this before. Where have I seen this before? So that was on a Friday afternoon, I went home, there was a movie night at my boys' school. I, brought, I walked them down the street. We went to the movie nights. It was the Trolls movie, which I assume very few of you have seen. <laughs> Trolls movie is not a quality entertainment. And, and so I was, I was just thinking about this. And so I pull out my computer. I kind of slide <laughs> off to the side. And I'm just looking through papers. And I found the plot I was looking for. 
So um, Kristen Manu, who's at University of Toronto, published uh, a paper where he predicted this sort of Gaussian shape. This is temperature versus that efficiency, this 1% number here. And there was this Gaussian here. I'll come back to in just one minute here. So with this Gaussian, we can eliminate the radius anomaly. So if there's no inflation, you see for this different um, incident fluxes, all the planets appear to be too large. But with this Gaussian, we can essentially, there's still some scatter. We can eliminate almost all this radius anomaly. This is the best fit compared to uh, other models that we tried, like the red curve and the yellow curve. So it turns out there was an idea about 10 years ago that goes back to uh, Batygin and Stevenson and some other authors that um, uh, there's this idea of omic dissipation. And so it's a little complicated, but the basic idea is that um, a hot Jupiter, we think, has a permanent hot side and a permanent night side. And you get a wind that drives flow from the day side to the night side. And that wind is always getting driven from the day side to the night side. But that wind also has uh, alkalis, and that's ionized alkalis that are thermally ionized. So you're actually driving a current from day to night. At the same time, the planet has its own dynamo coming from the deep interior. And so what ends up happening is the zonal winds drive a current into the deep, into the deep atmosphere that gets dissipated omically. I don't want to spend a ton of time, but this has been thought of as a, as a, as a possibility for how you might inflate hot Jupiters by driving energy into the deep interior. The thing that's most important about it is it predicts this sort of Gaussian shape. If you're relatively cold, you still have the wind, but there's no ions in the wind. If you're, if you're too hot, you have so many ions in the wind that there's a drag, so there's almost no flow from day to night. So there's a sweet spot at around, well, it's unclear exactly, we would say around 1,600 degrees, which fits well with, this, with our Gaussian shape. And so while this doesn't prove that omic dissipation is the answer, we at least now have a functional form of what the intrinsic power actually looks like, the population tells us this is what's actually happening in the planets. Uh, and so some variant of this omic dissipation model might end up being the right one, or at least it's on the right track. I want to spend the last few slides talking about a connection to exoplanet atmospheres, because here again, we can use the population to tell us something that we couldn't tell from an individual object on its own. So this is the same sort of Gaussian shape. Uh, now, instead of looking at this emit this power, we can characterize this in terms of this intrinsic temperature. So for stars, we talk about the effective temperature all the time. For planets, we can actually talk about three different temperatures. One is the effective temperature, but one is the intrinsic temperature. That is the amount of energy you have coming out of the interior if there was no star. So that's another version of the effective temperature. So this intrinsic temperature tells us how much energy is coming out of the deep interior of the planet. So for Jupiter, this number is about 100 Kelvin. And so people had, for a long time, assumed that that 100 Kelvin number is probably similar for the hot Jupiters also. But what we can do now is, uh, through this work, is we actually can fit a functional form of the intrinsic temperature as a function of the planet's equilibrium temperature. And it again, it looks like this sort of Gaussian shape. But this actually changes our view of what we think the deep, in the deep atmospheres of planets are doing. So high fluxes from the interior leads to a much shallow, shallower radiative convective boundary. So if we, if we jump back a few slides, oh, we're jumping. All right, I'll hold on here. If we jump back a few slides. If you have a very low flux coming out of the interior, you have a very deep radiative convective boundary. If you have a very high flux coming out of the interior, you have a very shallow radiative convective boundary. So while the upper atmosphere looks the same in either case, because that's dominated by energy from the star, the deep atmosphere is controlled by what's going on in the deep interior. And so what this does is it means you have a much shallower radiative convective boundary. And so it changes what's happening in the deep atmosphere. So on the, on the bottom, we computed a bunch of different pressure temperature profiles for different atmospheres. That's 0.15 AU, 0.1 AU, 0.015 AU, getting closer and closer to the parent star. And we computed models in black here that have a shallow radioconvective boundary and a deep radioconvective boundary in black. 
And then in, I can now see very hard to read yellow. <laughs> we have a model with a shallow rated convective boundary and a deep rated convective boundary. And what this does is it changes a few different things about the atmosphere. Probably most important is that it changes where clouds form. So uh, these, these dashed curves here are showing you where different cloud species form. So as an example, we can look at MG2SiO4. What's that? That's a silicate cloud that we know is really common in brown dwarfs, and we think it should be common in hot Jupiters too. And so if you take the cold interior with a dot, with the, with the, with the model that comes down here, you form a cloud way down deep in the atmosphere at a kilobar. You would never see that cloud. It's forming really down deeply. But if you have a hot, a hot atmosphere, you'll come on this curve here, you'll form the cloud much, much higher in the atmosphere at around a few bars. This is a cloud you would see. So as a, if the population as a whole has much hotter interiors than you otherwise expected, you should see clouds forming much higher in the atmosphere. So the population, we think, should be dominated by clouds, whereas if they all had cold interiors, you might not see the clouds. So the clouds should form the visible atmosphere. It also uh, leads you to keeping metals up in the atmosphere as well. And so what this leads to is if you calculate the radiative convective boundary, it's not down deep in the atmosphere at kilobars. The radiative convective boundary is probably at around a bar for a bunch of different surface gravities for these planets. So a testable prediction then um, that's related to the interior models is that these objects should all have relatively cloudy atmospheres because the cloud should be forming in the visible atmosphere, not down deep below. That's a prediction we can test to some degree with the James Webb Space Telescope. So I want to wrap it up then by bringing it back to the first part of the talk and then the second part. So uh, this really is a, a golden age in comparative planetary sciences. If you look at the history of the solar system, People have done a lot of discussion about comparative planetary science, Uranus to Neptune, Earth to Venus, Jupiter to Saturn. We can do that now in a much larger sample size. We can look at a much wider range of planets. So the sub-Neptune population and the radius gap can be understood as a population that's sculpted by mass loss, a population we can try to characterize in much better detail with Tess and James Webb. There's a clear mass metallicity relation for giant planets, something that we did not know five years ago. And that is the characteristic slope and spread. We can study that with a much larger sample size as TESS finds ever more planets. We're starting to understand various aspects of the planet-star composition connection for the first time, but it's just coming into view. It does not look simple. It does not look like metal-rich stars are making metal-rich planets. And that for hot Jupiters, we have some evidence for ohmic dissipation, perhaps being the right answer for what explains their uh, large radii. And we suggest much shallower radiative convective depths than previous expectations. So what unifies this kind of uh, mishmash of conclusions is these are all things you could not have pulled out from a sample size of a few. These are all things you can only have pulled out with a sample size of 50 to hundreds or more. And so this is really the path I think we're going to be charting as exoplanets goes into the sample size from hundreds to thousands to, I don't know how long I'll live, tens of thousands. Um, and you can also think about this for rocky planets too, right? Of course, rocky planet science is a ways behind giant planet science. They're harder to find. They're harder to study. But this sort of comparative planetary science is the thing we should be thinking about uh, moving to in the future. So thanks a lot. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jonathan. OK, uh, great. Well, we've got some time for uh, questions. Any questions for Jonathan? All right, Charles. So relatively early in your talk, um, you showed evidence for accretion onto planetary cores of yeah. extremely metal-rich material. Mm -hmm. Is that consistent with our understanding or our modeling or observation of protoplanetary disks, that there is this material there with this high level of enrichment? It's a great question. I think it depends on how you think about the structure of the disks, right? I mean, um, if, all the, if all the solids settle to the midplane, or most of them do, then I would naturally think that that's, um, in the regions where the planets are forming, you're naturally going to have a metallicity enhancement compared to the bulk disk if the, most of the solids are there. It's a little hard to tell, though, because... Um, 
if you're looking at disk um, mass measurements from dust, you don't know what fraction of the solids are still in dust versus having formed larger objects. And if you're looking at the mass of the disk from CO, for instance, you also don't know to what degree that CO is a great tracer for uh, the amount of gas in that disk. So I would say there's not a great understanding of that observationally, other than the, the, the assumption, of course, that the disk bulk composition should be the same as the parent star's bulk composition. Um, do you worry a little bit about selection effects in, in the following sense? Uh, the transit technique favors nearing planets, yeah, you know, yeah. whether, whether those planets are representative of planets that are not being detected because they're farther out. And the other effect is migration, uh, that you're, you're seeing planets here that in all likelihood form farther out. So this mass metallicity relation seems to have at least two complicating factors uh, in, in its interpretation. I absolutely agree with you. You're right. So, um, we are seeing just a subset of the population. One of the things we can start to do to try to maybe mitigate against that is a hard thing, but um, once we have spectra of the atmospheres of those planets, and we can measure abundances to ascertain the, the envelope metallicities, that is something you could directly compare for directly imaged planets that are on, you know, let's say five to 50 AU orbits. And so there you could start to think about whether or not the metallicities you determine for the close-in planets are similar or different to those from the more distant planets. So that would be one way you could try to compare those two populations. Of course, you'd never be able to do the exact, I mean, you're not gonna have a transiting planet at 50 AU, right? So that's, I think the best case then would be to use different methods to study those different populations to try to compare the apples to apples as best you can, like water vapor abundance, methane abundance, carbon monoxide abundance. But yeah, I think there's, uh, there's definitely a lot to be done with how does that migration process change the planet itself? Maybe if you're migrating through a disk, maybe you eat a lot of metals along the way. Whereas if you're if you migrate dynamically after the disk goes away, maybe those planets um, are not ones that accrete more metals. So one of the things we've kind of talked about in our group is when, when the sample size gets larger, could we start to cut the sample? Like, could you look at systems that were the planets known to be aligned with the star's equator versus ones that are misaligned? Maybe those are different populations. Could we see that in terms of the metallicity of the planets or something like that? So I have thought about it. There's no easy answer. I think. Uh, let's see, so Selma next, and then, yeah. I reveal my intuition from stars, which completely doesn't apply here or dust, but if in a star we make it slightly more metal rich, it tends to inflate because of opacity effects. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, are we in a regime that, that extra metals in the outer side of the planet can actually, by opacity, make it bigger than smaller? Do we understand the opacity is well enough to even know in the planet? Yeah, so, so uh, that's a great question. So, um, uh, it, in planets, that effect does happen a little, a little bit, but it's dominated by the excess density, just because the metallicities are so large. So, so what I haven't done is done the fully self-consistent solution calculation. You could imagine, so uh, we have an outer boundary condition that, that dictates how the planets cool off over time. So uh, we're using one outer boundary. So what you could do is calculate a bunch of different outer boundaries and a bunch of different metallicities and then iterate over and over and over again so each planet was consistent. And so we haven't done that. So that is going to, if we did do that, it would, it would make all the metallicities actually probably go up a little bit because you would have this counteracting effect of the metals slowing the cooling. So I, I would say that most of these are probably modest lower limits on the amount of metals you'd need. It's a great question. So actually, earlier on you showed that uh, the, you know, the heavy elements that are getting accreted to your planet would actually increase by increasing the mass of planets. 
However, later on, from later on uh, toward the end, you show that metallicity decreases when you increase the mass of planet. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to map these two together because if you increase, if you actually accrete more kind of metal in, in, when you increase the mass of planet, you would expect that in other uh, snapshots you may see the uh, metallicity is higher unless your mass loss is actually higher for those that are that are actually that accreted more metal. So uh, you see, Bami, right? Uh, he, exactly. So this is just the trend is just opposite to other trend of, from this strike afterward. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, another way to think of so um, the planets as their as as their total mass is increasing, the amount of metals is also increasing. Right. But at a, at a uh, the slope is such that even though the planets are are have more total metals, the metallicity is actually going down. Um, so, so. Does it have anything to do with mass loss that you actually, or is, or is just? Um, probably not. Um, uh, this is, I think, just due to the accretion history of the planet planet formed. Um, from observations we have of hot Jupiter mass loss, we think that they probably only lose maybe one or two percent of their mass over time. And so that probably doesn't uh, affect their, their bulk metallicities. So there is a small amount of mass loss, but I don't think it affects this story here. Any other questions? Uh, uh, so I was wondering why you why it was chosen to uh, not extrapolate beyond 10 Jupiter masses a little bit, even a little bit. Uh, is there any choice of that? Is it seem like ground is behaving differently, or is it just 10 because it looks good? Yeah. No, uh, um, that was driven by, at the time, um, this diagram, in that we wanted things that were definitely uh, transiting objects below 1,000 degrees. And at the time, uh, there's definitely transiting brown dwarfs. There's, I don't know, maybe 10 now? 26. Really? <laughs> oh, shoot, I wish you get on that. OK. So at the time, uh, we only wanted ones below 1,000 degrees. And so um, I, think, I think there was probably one or two transiting brown yeah. dwarfs that were cool at the time. Yeah. So we cut it off at 10 Jupiter masses. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, we have talked about certainly coming back to this, and one of, one of the things Daniel wrote in his postdoc application was thinking about, about that very topic, to what degree we could validate what we're doing by this. Because um, yeah, you would expect the brown dwarfs, right? To, so like well, the one lines over here, right? So you'd expect them to really yeah. asymptote yeah. right onto that, basically. Yeah, right. yeah that's yeah. right. Um, at fixed uh, incident flux, mm -hmm. would you expect the fulmic dissipation to depend on metallicity? I think I think so. I don't know if anyone's looked at that, but um, I think that's true. Yeah, I mean, like, the the the, the tr I think that's true. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, it should be. Um, Do you have enough information to add that to your model to fit for uh, inflation, metallicity, you know, correlation at fixed incident flux? I don't know. Once you fix it, I'm worried about the, the planet population would start to get pretty small if you did it in the little incident flux bin. That's a good question. I'm not sure. Curious. When you when you show your your demographics plots of various kinds, you, yeah. you'll typically have a bunch of exoplanets, and then from the solar system, you'll show Venus through Neptune. Say, mm -hmm. does it add any interest, uh, intellectual interest, to include the dwarf planets from the outer solar system, which increase the numbers of your own diversity? It is. A, it depends on the context, right? So, um, so if you're thinking about like like ISIS and stuff, right? So. Um, Earth, Venus, and Mars are all about two thirds rock, one third iron, more or less. Whereas, like Pluto is actually, um, people think of it as like an ice chunk, but it's actually seventy percent rock iron. 
only 30% ices. And so those dwarf planets, I think, um, are suggestive in that giant planets, when people talk about ices and like, like an icy core, that maybe um, you never end up with as much ice as you might think otherwise. So like Ganymede, uh, you know, big icy objects and moons, they, they tend to be never as ice rich, not in all cases, but often they're not as ice rich as you otherwise might think them to be. And so that might suggest that even ice giants like Uranus and Neptune might not have as much ice as you think they do. They might actually have a lot of rock in their interiors more than we naively expect. So that's one, one way, I think, in which those planets are interesting to think about how they inform planetary understanding. Herman? This is a very unfundamental question, but I'm just curious. Sure. You had the luminosity due to radioactivity mm -hmm. as a function of time. Mm -hmm. And it was very untypical in the sense that it had nothing to do with the falling off due to radioactive decay. There was something else at work there where it was essentially a flat curve and then started falling off relatively rapidly. And I was wondering what was going on. Oh, that's a, I don't remember what the mix. I think we had, we had to pick some mixture of, I think it was uranium, thorium, I don't remember off the top of my head, yeah. It did, it did look kind of, yeah, it was like flat and then fall off. Yeah. Right, it's kind of irrelevant at the beginning and it just kind of is... Yeah, yeah, kind of yeah of right. At, at early it times... It surprised me. Yeah. I was wondering what it was due to. I'd have to look at the models again, I'm sorry. I don't have a good answer off the top of my head. I, I was just reacting to this uh, plot. Yeah. And the spread, I think, is quite intriguing because it means that whatever you have there is not th stochastic. Right. You would get a gas in otherwise. Yeah, so right. you have different That's populations. Nice. Yeah. If you do the strips, do you find any differences in those planets or their stars? We have we have tried. Uh, there's a there's a there's a plot in the paper that I didn't I didn't put in here where we've tried to look at. Um, um, you know, we've looked uh, at a given mass bin, right? There's not a lot of planets, but nothing pops out. We've looked at. Um, breaking the sample up into you know, the low mass stars, the high mass stars, the planets on circular orbits, planets on eccentric orbits. Now what we, about if, if you do a strip along that, like, that correlation? Like this way? No, no. no it just follows following, the line. Following, uh, the, uh -huh. the uh -huh. Like those at the very bottom. For yeah, the yeah, yeah. But you're right, it's not a guess. Yeah. It's, it's right, yeah. right, right, right. Cool. right. Okay, great. Any final questions? All right. Let's All right.